Shall I speak louder? Um, just to, shall I actually give the summary to the of the paper of uh, Fatia as well? We could make it this morning. Yes. Uh, okay. Fatia, en fait, a envoyé un petit message. Elle n'a pas réussi à venir. Okay. Yeah, we're having a difficulty because there is a strike of trains, and so unfortunately, some of our speakers were not able to arrive because of the strike. But anyway, he's okay. going to summarize her paper too. Okay. Another comment or remark I'd like to to, to make uh, uh, by way of introduction is uh, this is a summary of uh, this is a pretty detailed summary of the, of the the papers that were sent to me over the past few days. So uh, what I mean by this is that I'm going to develop ideas that were not necessarily uh, you know, expressed to you out loud uh, by the three speakers uh, earlier this morning. So the, I don't want the, bi the fully bilingual people in this room to actually think this guy is lying. <laughs> they didn't say that. Okay? So just, uh, just a quick reminder. Okay, so one of the <coughs> obvious common features between the four papers, or three papers just presented, is uh, how Islamophobia needs to be apprehended in intersectional terms, uh, intersectionality being here at the crossroads between racial, social class, as well as gender prejudices. Uh, Huda, the first speaker, uh, has it that uh, intersectionality must inform both academic research on Islamophobia, but also the struggle of those political militants who actively engage with the issue. She refers to the standpoint theory and draws a parallel with the way historically African-American female militants started to comprehend their subaltern status, uh, even within certain political associations, by thinking in intersectional sectional terms. Uh, and then by bringing this in intersectional dimension back into academia, something which could be well reproduced in France within the forms of mobilization that make up her fieldwork. Huda insists on the necessity to take into account three intersectional, intersectional dimensions here, one of which, well, that's the third dimension, uh, is the gender dimension uh, linked to the agency of females that struggle against discrimination. She talks of how, in gender or racial terms, the notion of discrimination is more practical. Uh, sorry, the notion of uh, um, uh, the notion of, r of racial discrimination is more practical and has legal status, whereas there is still a need to objectify discrimination on strictly religious grounds. She lastly describes the evolution of anti-racist associations which opposed the exclusion from school of those veiled high school pupils back in 1989, whereas they actually endorsed it in 2003. Uh, the need for these anti-racist associations to include a um, re religious uh, discrimination agenda has actually spawned other types of associations that were unhappy with uh, uh, the uh, attitude of these uh, 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 pretty well-known anti-racist associations in France. Um, intersectionality also informs much of the discrimination that both Alexandra and Fatia, who couldn't make it this morning, uh, are studying in their respective papers. According to Fatia, uh, on, the, on the French job market, women wearing a headscarf are more likely to be discriminated against than men who grow a beard, uh, owing to the potential ambiguity in growing a beard, a choice which is not necessarily construed as religion, uh, as, as religion motivated, of course. She coins the word uh, headscarphophobia or foularophobie in the French language and looks into the very specific case of the practicing fee uh, Muslim females on the French job market at a time when it is more and more often claimed that to wear a hijab in public space, i.e. at work, uh, goes against the so-called principle of neutrality in France or principe de neutralité. Uh, this hazy concept made the headlines in one recent scandal, the Babylou nursery, where one employee was fired because she had decided to wear a hijab. Um, and this is an ongoing case, of course. Uh, those of you who live in this country probably uh, know that in detail. Uh, this in France has been instrumentalized as a sort of cause célèbre for members of parliament willing to uh, introduce bills banning uh, uh, religious ostensible signs at work. Fatia insists a great deal on how much of the discrimination against these women who wear veils takes place just before uh, job interviews. The idea being that in many cases you don't stand a chance of being employed if your appearance is interpreted as Islamic. Uh, this is true whatever ethnic, uh, 
or racial group you may belong to. It's also true for, uh, for white, veiled uh, uh, Muslim females. Uh, Fatia uh, uses the analysis made by Jean-François Amadieu on the crucial role played by physical appearances and nonverbal language during job interviews when the discussion of the, well, when the discussion at a job interview generally only serves to confirm the preconceived, the preconceived ideas recruiters had at first glance. So the first eye contact is, is crucial. Um, in such circumstances, uh, wearing a veil is, is more often than not the ultimate decisive criterion preventing you from getting a job unless you're willing to do cleaning work or uh, work in, in, in uh, call centers. Lastly, Fatia draws a contrast between different categories of women who circumvent the hostility against veiled women, veiled women by choosing to wear a small hat, a bandana, etc., etc. In such cases, um, it happens that those who are French white converts to Islam more often manage to dissimulate their conversion and often don't run into trouble, albeit, of course, at the price of a humiliating dissimulation. Whereas uh, those who make the same choices and originate from North Africa, for instance, uh, get discriminated against all the same. There, these are some of the discoveries that her research has allowed her to make. Now, let me move on to Al Alexandra's paper. Uh, she also looks into the articulation of prejudices and discrimination on the French job market, uh, and at how Islamophobia is routinely uh, left at the margins of anti-discrimination dynamics. She does so by summarizing two qualitative studies she has made, one on, on how private business recruiting agents mobilize uh, non-discrimination principles, the other on how trade union militants from one key French union, uh, um, which has remained anonymous, uh, respond uh, to the various uh, ethnic and racial forms of discrimination. She insists a great deal on the complexity of different forms of discrimination, compounded by the current difficulty in taking into account religious elements in discrimination, despite Article 13 of the Treaty of Amsterdam, which was signed in 1997 and implemented two years later. This difficulty uh, owes much to a certain vagueness in certain notions used with diversity or diversité in the French language uh, being one. Uh, the diversity catchphrase starting to win, started to win kudos with the media and private companies by around 2004-2005 and it's pretty unsure whether it has helped engage seriously with distinct forms of discrimination, owing indeed to its sheer vagueness. Managerial diversity of a kind has made it possible in some way to integrate a religious dimension in anti-discrimination policies, however flimsy this has been. Uh, this is made possible thanks to the actual malleability of ethnic and racial criteria, or to put it mo more bluntly, Diversity becomes a sort of showcase for tolerance among companies and certain practices or rituals associated to Islam, like the practice of Ramadan, halal food, or working time accommodations, uh, might be accepted uh, or indeed embraced in order to project a non-discriminatory image. Despite this, Alexandra has witnessed in her research that most interviewees, whether in private businesses or in trade unions, refuse to take into account, let alone accommodate, certain practices linked to Islam. The way this choice is made and the way it is expressed is actually noteworthy. Alexandra thinks that these responses broadly fit into two categories. Uh, firstly, there are the claims made in favor of Muslim practices are dismissed offhand are as ways of abusing, of instrumentalizing anti-discrimination principles. In this case, a stark opposition is being made between such claims and supposedly genuine anti-discrimination. In other words, anti-discrimination in this regard is transformed into a critique uh, of Muslim self-ghettoization or communitarism in the French language. Uh, the second scenario or the second category is a kind of inhibition or a keeping at arm's length of non-discrimination generated by fear uh, of controversy around Islam. Uh, here, within this general category, you seem to have two subcategories or two different uh, uh, storylines. Um, first of all, you have a sort of giving up attitude uh, where interviewees refer dejectedly to some sort of a Pandora's box. Uh, the idea being, uh, if we allow this, uh, then we're going to have to allow that, and then we're going to have to allow that, and then there's no end to it. Uh, 
The other attitude uh, uh, is the somewhat ironic stress on the need to protect those who are uh, discriminated against. Uh, in other words, we shouldn't make too much noise about uh, discrimination because ultimately this is going to be at the expense of the discriminated uh, persons themselves. Uh, one interviewee illustrates this quite nicely, I quote, um, I have some Africans, Moroccans, Algerians working with me. I don't, I don't talk about discrimination to them every day because they, like me, don't want to hear about discrimination. It may be because they suffered from it when young. I don't know because I, I, I was in a school with them, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Alexandra didn't write blah, blah, blah in her article or in the, in the summary she sent me. Uh, Alexandra insists on how the struggle against discrimination itself is, of course, not devoid of prejudices. And it would be a mistake to obviously starkly oppose the struggle to uh, stereotyping. In its most articulated forms, anti-discrimination must generate a complex reflection on these stereotypes. Uh, shall I get five or six more minutes? Is that all right? Yeah? Okay. Well, um, Marwan then uh, apprehends this difficulty to recognize Islamophobia or to engage with anti-Muslim prejudices from what seems to be another perspective altogether. He starts off from the postulate that today the Muslim problem has become an obvious social fact, by which is meant that the very existence of this problem is taken for granted by all, or nearly all, uh, and doesn't require further justification. He goes into various historical reasons for that, some having to do with the history of immigration, but most having to do with the evolution of France into an ultra-secular republic in a movement that started off at least with the French Revolution. Then he notices, and probably laments, how slow and belated have been the attempts at gauging uh, exclusion and discrimination on a religious basis. One illustration is the long-awaited <coughs> breakthroughs made possible by the TNO, uh, sounds like PNO to me in English, but uh, Trajectory and, or and Origins, Trajectoire and Origine, l'enquête uh, TO, uh, that Patrick Simon will de deal with in further detail uh, this afternoon. Uh, the acknowledgement of the existence of racial discrimination is general, uh, but as far as Islamophobia is concerned, in other words, discrimination on religious grounds, the question uh, is uh, being posed uh, uh, in different terms, as uh, uh, Huda had said herself. And obviously there's no uh, uh, political, media, or epidemic uh, consensus on it. On it. Certain cultural, political, as well as historical reasons need to be taken into account to come to terms with this very specificity. Despite all this, uh, Marwan uh, notices that there has been an increase over the past decade in the sheer number of evaluating tools which make it possible to state clearly that there is such a thing as a religious penalty, or rather a social penalty linked to a fully assumed or uh, uh, presumed affiliation to Islam, whether indeed the, uh, this affiliation is visible or suspected. To Marwan, one of the crucial challenges in the sociology of Islamophobia is to work out how economic, political, legal, and identity logics tie in together. It is no coincidence that one of the first political constructions of the Muslim problem in France should have taken place in 1983 in car-making factories uh, precisely at a time when the socialist left uh, um, was converted to uh, austerity, austerity measures. It was the Mowa government back in 1983 who promoted a religious fundamentalist reading to what was actually, in fact, a classical type of industrial unrest affecting some immigrant workers in car making factories. Um, to him, this event has a kind of parabolic status linked to how identity politics is helpful, indeed, to divide the working classes, and um, it's also, it also shows uh, how, strong re how strong rejection may be when one decides to see a fellow worker as primarily a Muslim, rather than a fellow worker. Um, Marwan then connects all this to the issue of intersectionality as well, by insisting on the epistemological distinction to be made between ascriptive elements, ascriptive elements which are innate and external, such as gender or skin color, uh, uh, or the fact of being uh, physically disabled, for instance, or, and so the, 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 the contrast between ascriptive elements on the one hand, and on the other hand, acquisitive elements, which have to do with individual choices that at the end of the day are removable. 
such as uh, a, a, a woman deciding to, uh, to wear a, a veil, for instance. Uh, during his talk earlier this morning, he talked about the sense of uh, sheer betrayal that was felt by the political elite when they realized back in 1989 that a certain number of collegiennes or high school uh, pupils uh, were ready to wear a veil. Um, lastly, uh, betrayal to the assimilationist uh, 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 mythology in the French Republic, that's, that's what he meant. Uh, lastly, Marwan refers to the long de domination in French academia on Islam of uh, political scientists and um, scholars of Islam who very often study forms of Islam which are far removed geographically from the French context. This is changing now, and many new types of research are challenging, are challenging this hegemony, um, which has encroached largely on the media scene. And he welcomes the fact that such a conference as the conference being organized today uh, should take place, much the same as there was another conference organized back in April at Sciences Po Paris, um, which, which gives visibility to this uh, academic debate on Islamophobia. Uh, but it is to be lamented uh, uh, still that apprehending Islam as a political or social problem, uh, and only a social problem itself, uh, has repeatedly made the headlines and even benefited, benefited from public funding, Whereas, on the other hand, engaging with Islamophobia and the reject, rejection of Muslims and Islam hasn't at all. In such a respect, France has fared fairly differently from Anglo-Saxon countries, where research on Islamophobia is more developed and where research programs on it are more numerous. Thank you very much, everybody.